in the dark shadows, in the white cold. Fearlessly we search for knowledge new and old. We drink the strong spirits and read the ancient tomes. The order of the abracast. We are the brave and the bold. In the 12th century, there was still no monolithic German state. Each city and region had its own rulers and bishops loosely under the controls of the Holy Roman Emperor, who theoretically protected the region against foreign invasion. However, the emperor, at the time Henry V, uh, had been preoccupied for decades with the Rhineland, Italy, and southern Germany. Most of the northern regions, such as Bremen and Magdeburg, were left to fend for themselves, and none of the minor kingdoms, however, had forsworn their right as Christians to seize the territories to the east from the supposed heathens who inhabited that land. In 1108, the religious leaders of Magdeburg called on their fellow Christians to take such land from the Slavs in 1110 to 1124. One noble named Lothair attempted to do just that, and he formed alliances with local warlords and grabbed a large portion of the eastern territory for himself. In 1125, Lothair became, became a king of the Germans, but when he died in 1137, a, despite, a dispute rose over his rightful successor, and the Slavic lands that he had conquered were mostly neglected. The Abracast, occult, history, conspiracy, and violence. to your heart recording deep below the stigmata studios bunker deep in the heart of the quarantine zone charlie in the people's republic of pennsylvania hut hut all hail our fearless leader governor egghead i am john and this is the abracast thank you guys for tuning in i appreciate it uh we did a couple mm, we had a couple extra episodes. Well, we had one at least one extra episode last week. So we're getting back to our regularly scheduled programming, which is um, part three. I guess it's officially part three of the Second Crusade. Um, and this is interesting. So this is while France and England are all in the Templars and all that stuff are all in the Holy land fighting these Germans. We're going to see go, Hey, what, what about these pagans up here? What about these motherfuckers up here that have been a thorn in my side for many generations? And they go up there and they try to deal with it. That's the part of the second crusade. We're going to be talking about this evening before we get into that. I just want to remind everybody that my big, deal my big water of the art operation is coming up on june 3rd uh at 11 it's wednesday june 3rd at 11 p.m i'm going to be doing uh a little bit of ritual magic <laughs> creating some water of, of the art and i'm going to be sharing the jars of the water of the art with uh, my folks on the vessel of the art patreon or subscribe star tier it's a ten dollar, ten dollar tier. You're like water the art. What the fuck is that? And what I'm saying, bro, is you sprinkle it on stuff that you use for rituals, and then you also use it in exorcisms. And if you use it, it chases all the phantoms away. <laughs> Who wouldn't want some dope wizard water? You go to abracast.com. There's a whole there's a whole section on it. Uh, it's up for right now, at least. I don't know how long it'll be. It'll stay up there. Um, so you can like learn about the, um, 
about the operation and there's a lot of like there's some behind uh behind the scenes video available to patreon and subscribe star people up there so speaking of patreon and subscribe star um may April, May, and June. Yeah, those are the three months we're doing. Um, we're discussing the lost, the lost city state of Atlantis or whatever it is. Um, so that's fun. It'll be the third one. This I think is going to be the destruction of Atlantis for, um, for June. So that's up there. And speaking of Patreon and subscribe star, uh, people, uh, would like to welcome aboard Frater Theta one, five, six, abyss alpha Omega. Thank you very much, sir. And if you guys are generous enough to have a vessel of the art, go ahead and raise it to the sky. If you don't have a vessel of the art, just whatever you're drinking, raise it up to the sky and thank my Patreon and subscribe star supporters for supporting the show without you. Uh, none of this is possible and welcome aboard freighter theta one, five, six abyss alpha Omega. I look forward to uh, sending you some fresh gear. So this evening, the featured article, I guess, this featured entry is Baptism or Death, the Wendish Crusade, 1147 to 1185. Um, this is from the Warfare History Network. It's by a guy named Kirk Freeman. So shout out to him out there. And that was the first paragraph of the, the cold open there. So getting back into it. During the search for this new successor, many poor German landowners on the borderlands between the Slavs to the east and the Saxons to the west decided to increase their holdings by taking land from their Wendish neighbors. From 1140 to 1143, scores of Saxon families streamed into the Wendish lands and set up uh, wooden palisade forts, halls, and stone towers. Two of the larger and more powerful lords, Count Adolf II, who believed the Wends and Germans could live side by side, and uh, his powerful rival, Henry of Badewide, who did not, advanced farther east and seized several towns that had been Christianized years before and technically were not up for grabs. However, Henry quickly conveniently made the missionary priest in one of the towns a bishop, and all political and theological quibbles were swept under the rug. Motherfuckers. <laughs> By 1147, once the powerful Wendish overlord, Prince Nyklot, had lost a large portion of the Western Kingdoms, while territory in the South had been seized by another German warlord, Albert the Bear. What already had been a century of constant border raiding and small-scale skirmishes was turning into a flood of German invaders. To make matters worse, at the start of the year of the Wends themselves initiated a raid that ultimately would work against them. The Wendish lands under Adolf II were actually in a good situation. The Count believed that the Wendish people and his German newcomers could work together. His policy was working, but also inadvertently caused fear among the neighboring tribes that their own ways of life might be endangered shortly after the start of the new year. Fanatical Wendish warriors from one of these tribes attacked and slaughtered the people of Adolf's land, Germans as well as Wends. The, this large and ill-timed raid uh, ruined Adolf's fortunes and ended the career of the Wends' best German ally. When Bernard of Clairvaux, remember we've been talking about this guy in all of this Second Crusades business, Bernard of Clairvaux came to Germany a short while later, to call for the crusade against the Saracens. And anger from this residual raid helped tip the scales against Nyklot's people. The coalition against the Wends. With his enormous personal charisma, Bernard quickly raised 25,000 crusaders from France and southern Germany to head for the Holy Land. Only a fifth of that number actually reached Palestine. Bernard made a little headway raising troops in Spain, where constant skirmishes between various small kingdoms preoccupied the Spanish 
More than the call for a new crusade, northern Germany was a different matter. The Germans had both the manpower and the funds to answer the call, but as Bernard was about to discover, they did not necessarily have the will. When Bernard attended the Reichstag at Frankfurt, he found the nobles arguing for attack against the pagans to their east. So animated was their argument that Bernard sent the matter to Pope uh Eugenius for consultation on April 13th, 1147, Eugenius issued a divine dispensation permitting the Germans to attack the pagan Wends under the spiritual guidance of Bishop Aslam of Halverg. The crusade, the crusaders were allowed to wear sacred crosses on their surcoats and Bernard instructed the crusaders on the fine points of how to treat the Slavs who fell under their control. Quote, with God's help, he said, uh, the abbot, they shall be either converted or deleted. <laughs> Spoken like a true cyberman, <laughs> abbot, uh, mercy was not allowed. It was either baptism or slaughter. During the rush to convert the heathens, no one seemed to notice that most of the money used to outfit the crusaders had come from the uh, come from tribute regularly paid by the Wends themselves to the Germans living along their border. <clears> That's <throat> irony for you right there. <laughs> Ugh. The Germans uh, were not the only supporters of the Wendish Crusade. The Danes also saw a golden opportunity, not so much to gain land and wealth, but to eliminate a troublesome people who had waged piracy on Denmark ships for generations and vied with them for lucrative sea trade in the Baltic region. To the east of the Wends, the Poles also saw a, cha a chance to grab land for themselves, again with the full authority of the Pope. In the ill-starred year of 1147, the winds found themselves facing simultaneous invasions from the east, west, and the north. There was little success for the bear and the lion. When he realized his predicament, the capable and fiercely proud Prince Nylot, they called him Nyclot earlier, Nyclot, so I don't know where the typo is who had lost his lands in the south and along the western frontier over the past several years, launched a counterattack into Wagaria, a region belonging to Adolf II. In June 1147, weakened and shaken by the loss of the lands to the east in the earlier attacks, the, the region fell quickly to the Wendish attackers, and the immense devastation of the German villages gave added inducement to the assembling armies to attack the heathens who had dared take German lands. By the late summer of 1147, two Danish fleets, <laughs> just two, two Danish fleets and two large Saxon armies attacked the Wends while the Danes harried the North shore. Duke Henry, the so-called lion of Saxony, launched his army against Nyklot. Here we go. We got the K back in there. Nyklot's outpost at Dobin. At the same time, the southern pincer attack with two armies, one led by the legate Enslem from Halvberg and at least six other bishops driving towards Poland. The other army was led by two southern German margraves or military governors, Conrad and Albert the Bear who initially started towards the Wendish stronghold at Demin, 135 miles away. Instead of driving to the original objective, however, the bishops convinced the two nobles to unite with them and march eastward. So Nyklot was not without tactical reasoning. He had uh, chosen to make his stand at Dobin because it was the only ground surrounded by both marshland and a lake. So we see this all the time and it's very uh, smart. Tie your defenses into um, 
train features. Man, we've been talking about this since Bodica. <laughs> uh, marshlands in a lake. From this strong point, Nile Clot kept two armies in the northern pincer occupied with a much smaller defensive force. The Danes and the third army in the northern forces having landed in Wendish territory were hampered by the need to protect the harbors of the Danish fleet. Nyklot sailed forth from Dobin and mauled the Danes, cutting off the Danish warriors from Saxon support while a Wendish fleet made a surprise attack on the Danish. No, not on the Danish! <laughs> shipping that lay at anchor in the northern harbors and fighting the fighting was done uh, close in with war axes five foot long swords and 11 foot long lances equipped with iron leaf shaped heads ideal for piercing mounted warriors also favored maces iron which are it explains iron headed clubs and war hammers sledges fixed to iron shafts and heavy armor made of chain mail scale mail or toughened leather provided a modicum of protection uh the two danish kings canute canute the fifth and swen the third soon became fed up with their combined defeats and blaming each other for their losses, raced back to Denmark to continue their long-standing civil war. Meanwhile, Henry the Lion and Archbishop Adabel, Ada, oh boy, Adalbero lay siege to Dobin under the winds, battle-weary and starving, finally agreed to relent and be baptized. Once the winds fulfilled their promise, the Saxon forces quickly withdrew, and the knights even stopped their foot soldiers from pillaging the area, declaring the land and its people to be fellow Christians, nor did they want to destroy a perfectly good base for future attacks. All right, I'm going to stop here. We're going to shift gears because I found this other thing that I wanted to talk about. And this comes from another source. This comes from uh, honors research thesis called the clash between pagans and Christians, the Baltic crusades from 1147 to 1309. Um, is written by Ronald, uh, Donald R. Shoemaker, the Ohio State, the Ohio State University, May 2014. Um, so here, hold on, let me just find this real quick. There's this interesting thing where he kind of expands on this idea that you have to be uh, baptized or sla slaughtered. He comes at it from a different kind of view. Let me just find this. All right, Donald R. Shoemaker has this to say. Before the Wendish Crusade began, several key ideological and institutional changes took place in the previous century that allowed the Crusades against the pagans to occur. One of these changes was a cultural shift whereby nobles were drawn to fighting the enemies of Christ. For example, religious reforms such as the truth the truce of peace of God enabled the crusades against the Muslims to occur. And subsequently the pagans in the Baltic, the truce of God was an attempt to curb the violence between Christian nations and established, uh, established a precedent of the church getting involved in warfare from a truce of God proclamation in Cologne, Germany, 1083. Wow, remember I was talking about the Cathedral of Cologne? What if that what if this proclamation came right from that right from that cathedral? Man, that would be sweet. I posted a couple pictures of that cathedral, the poster or not the poster, the the photo, the artwork or what the photograph of that cathedral on my Instagram if you want to check it out. Uh, okay, anyhow, back to this proclamation. Sorry for rambling. <laughs> if anyone attempts to oppose this pious institution and is willing to promise peace to God or to observe it, no priest in our diocese shall presume to say mass for him or shall take a care for his salvation. If he is sick, no Christian shall dare visit him. 
on his deathbed, he shall not receive the Eucharist unless he repents. Furthermore, the church stated that anyone who violated the peace would be excommunicated. A king's or a knight's eternal soul was jeopardized if he violated the peace the church proposed. The church gained some influence on how warfare was conducted through the peace and truce of God movement and how it connected the new knightly ethos. Knights were quickly embracing the poetic notion of fighting evil. And we see this. Uh, hold on. I'll just hold my fire. I'll hold. I'll keep my powder dry. <laughs> At the same time, the church was issuing reforms to try to reduce the infighting. The concern for one's soul made it important for a noble to obey the church. So when the church decided the Muslims or the pagans should be fought for the sake of Christianity, the nobility were much more likely to join this crusade. In one instance, Holy Roman Empire or Emperor Frederick II, this is jumping ahead in time quite a bit. This is from 1220 to 1250, but he promised to go on a crusade, but he kept delaying his departure, and eventually the papacy grew impatient and excommunicated him. These reforms demonstrate key changes, uh, and they were vital in the Baltic Crusades. Uh, so we were just talking about the knights were quickly embracing this poetic notion of fighting evil. And we know about this poetic notion about fighting evil because we've talked at length about the song of Roland. If you're interested in the song of Roland or the story of Roland, you can find it all in the um, featured topic link. I think it's, I think all the Roland episodes, I think are, will be under the Islam featured topic link section, but uh, the changing nightly ethos further contributed to the crusading movement. The song of Roland was about the conquest of Charlemagne in the eighth century, but it reveals how the nobles of the 11th century were embracing these poetic deeds. The tale was written in the 11th century. First, it depicted how an ideal knight should act. Count Roland, the hero in the tale, never loved the cowardly or proud or the wicked. Any knight who was not a good vassal. Crusaders, especially knights and military orders, were supposed to be humble. And of this quotation shows a rejection of pride. And furthermore, there is a denunciation of cowardice and wickedness in general. And those aspects carried over uh, into the Crusades. Roland is portrayed as nearly invincible knight. And the only reason he is not able to completely defeat the Muslims as they flee to Spain was that his horse was killed and he was left on foot. The tale conveyed a highly romanticized image of what a knight could be and should be a knight engaged foes who were intrinsically evil. Furthermore, knights were valiant defenders of Christendom. Moreover, when Roland died at the end of the tale, he was escorted to paradise. So fighting against the Muslims was seen as an honor with a distinct religious reward. The new mindset held by nobility in Europe helped foster the crusading movement that emerged in 1095. So I'm not trying to open up a whole analysis of ancient French poetry, <laughs> but when I read, uh, when I read the song of Roland for the, for the show, I found a level of hubris in Roland. So I don't know if that's just a post modern way of looking at it. Um, I mean, he did fight and he was a tough motherfucker, but he was stubborn. And in a way, his pride is what fucked him over because he refused to blow his horn to let uh, the front of the column know that they were being attacked. On. They were being outnumbered and attacked in the rear guard. So I'm not going to I'm not going to argue about that. I just felt like that I should have at least said it because I mentioned that I did episodes about it. And that's the conclusion that we all that I, <laughs> that we all, <laughs> that we all, the, the royal we all uh, found. But I thought that was interesting because that was a little bit something about the, it was a little different take about the baptize or, or slaughter. And it also, it also gave us like an insight 
that I didn't expect to find here. Like these were the knights that were around listening to these tales of Roland. It's like uh, soldiers from my generation when I was in the army. You know, we grew up we grew up with Rambo and Chuck Norris movies. It's kind of the way that I would think the kind of the way that I would think it would be analogous. You know, my, one of my shits growing up was, uh, my granddad used to love the dirty dozen. So every time it was on TV, I was watching the dirty dozen and I'm like, this is what the army's all about. (laughs) Getting these rowdy motherfuckers together and going to fuck some shit up or mash even, you know, like those were the Rollins that I grew up watching you know, as, as a kid. So I thought that that was interesting component to put in here as kind of as a way to talk about this, the romanticized night version of, you know, how that's what shaped these guys is. That's what shaped the culture of the knights at this time were these story, these romanticized stories of Roland, you know, and, um, and the, the the horn, the Oliphant horn, and Durandil, the magical sword with the saint's fucking knuckle in the hilt, and um, the golden spurs. I remember all of his homies had golden spurs. Like that's the shit that they grew up, you know, em, emulating. This is the this is what informed the culture of these knights that were going on these, um, uh, specifically on these cr- crusades. Learn more at abracast.com. Get bonus content by signing up for the mailing list. Get all that plus many exclusive episodes by supporting the show at patreon.com or subscribestar.com. Hey, don't forget to check out the Water of the Art operation. You can find that on the uh, information on, on the website. Get yourself some dope wizard water. If you want it, it's going to be, it's really going to be fun. I got a lot of, uh, behind the scenes videos exclusive on Patreon and subscribe star. We're going to be uh, filming the whole operation and, uh, all that, all that good stuff. So check it out on the website. Hi, I'm Lisa. I like coffee, bonfires, walks on the beach, old books. But you know what I really like? The paranormal. Strange stories and experiences. Psychic phenomena. So, if you're interested, come join me at Free and Open Mind and a healthy dose of skepticism. And we'll see what happens. Check out that immortal hour, everybody. Okay, back to um, this uh, baptism or death, the windish crusade by Kirk Freeman. Um, where was I? To the south, the armies of Conrad, Albert, the Bear, and various ad hoc religious leaders began to fall apart. Instead of t- attacking the Wends, they marched to the Christian city of Setin near Poland and they laid siege to the town. Both the bishops and the princes of the besieged city came out to parley with the southern army leaders, are, um, arguing successfully that they were in the wrong area and had no rights to the city. The Saxons discussed taking the city anyway. <laughs> but in the end, the religious leaders won out. And the Saxon army, uh, disgusted that no great plunder was to be allowed, returned home empty handed. The first year of the crusade against the Wends was more, uh, show than conquest. And Nyclot, who eventually surrendered the Dobin garrison and instructed his men to convert, had no real intention on embracing Christianity. The pagan shrines and idols remained 
and the winds returned to them as soon as the last Saxon banner was out of sight. The cohesion of the Saxons, Danes, and Poles crumbled in less time than it had taken the church leaders to convince the various groups to unite in the first place. The Danes, for their part, believed the Saxons had accepted a bribe to stand by idly while the winds mauled the Danish forces. I've mauled a Danish in my day or two. <laughs> the Saxons, in contrast, thought the Danes weak and unfit for alliance. The bishop could not stop. Uh, the- Uh, The bishops could not stop bickering among themselves over thighs and titles. And the barons despised the fact that the church claimed all conquered land for its own. Most important for Nyclot, at least, was the fact that not a foot of Wendish territory had been taken. The church suffered most of the Wendish debacle. St. Bernard had urged the soldiers to convert the heathens, but the bishops of Setlin said that when he watched the crusading army depart, if they had come to strengthen the Christian faith, they should do so by preaching, not by arms. Many Churchmen felt that the conversion of the Wendish pagans would depend not on military might, but on missionary zeal. The hearts and the minds is what they would say nowadays. Bernard's reputation as a crusading leader dwindled. Other Christian monks, however, began preaching that their divine mission was still being hiltered by devil-worshipping Wendish pagans. These pagans, they said, were either going into the baptismal pool or under the sword for over a century. See, and people are like, they didn't learn anything from the Crusades. <laughs> <laughs> like this is this is uh this is Islam doctrine in the f- leading up to the first crusade, right? Convert or the sword. Uh For over a century, German missionaries had attempted to convert the heathens in the religion, the martyrs by the score to show for their efforts. By 1147, the religious community of Saxony felt strong that Wendish soil had been sanctified by these martyrs and that the heathens, native or not, had no right to sacred land made holy by the blood of their martyred saints. I'm just going to shift back to Donald R. Shoemaker, the clash between pagans and Christians, the Baltic Crusades from 1147 to 1309, just for this one section here. The Baltic Crusades saw many ideological, institutional, and political shifts, but the events are seldomly discussed. This lack of discussion stems from several sources. One, it is a controversial top topic in the national histories of Christianized countries. Two, the effects seem to marginalize many Americans. And what? And three, the source material can be hard to find in English. However, the Baltic Crusades have been widely explored by German and Baltic historians. This is a divisive issue in the region, and many people still feel resentment about these crusades. As a result, they have no qualms writing partisan accounts to further their agenda. This drowns out the reliable historians who are trying to assess the crusades from a non-nationalistic viewpoint. The preconceived notion of the crusade and the nationalistic bias were addressed by the English-speaking authority on the Baltic Crusade, William Urban, in his article, Victims of the Baltic Crusade. Many assume the pagan tribes were all victims of foreign invaders and frequently compare the Baltic. uh, Oh, okay, I see. All right, (laughs) here we go. Uh, Compare the Baltic Crusades to the conquest of North American by Europeans. Some have advanced this argument of victimhood purely for political reasons. So what actually happened is distorted. The biggest problem with this perceived mindset is when the pagan tribes are viewed purely as victims, their agency is devalued. And that was not the case. These Baltic Crusaders consisted of winners and losers. And many of the pagan tribes were winners, such as the Lets and the Livs. The Lets and the Livs were weak and subjugated to stronger pagan tribes, and they increased their power through military and financial support 
From the Crusaders, many of the traditionally strong tribes waned in power as a result. The pagan tribes had traditional enemies, and the arrival of the Crusaders proved another tool to be used against them in their ongoing power struggle, and the tribes that capitalized on this opportunity fared well. The cultural challenge for historians such as the Baltic Crusaders is not falling into the preconceived notions of victimhood. Wow. (laughs) One must remember every group involved was fighting to win as much as the Crusaders were uh, spreading Christianity and their political organization. The pagan tribes were using these Crusaders to defeat their rivals. The complex nature of the Baltic Crusades is being evaluated by an increasing number of historians. The Baltic Crusade... Uh, Crusades were on the Crusades in the Holy Land. So many books discusses the Baltic Crusades as a side-by-side note to the Crusades in the Holy Land, such as the Anatomy of a Crusade, eleven thirteen to or sorry twelve thirteen to twelve twenty one by James M. Powell. That's actually how we're looking at it as a it's a little side quest that happened in the Second Crusade. Right, and this is something that came up. Um, I believe in one of my first conversations with the vessel of the art guy, um, we were talked about the crusades and, um, geo talked about geopolitics in the crusades. We also talked about Gundam and giant robots and stuff too. But the thing, um, Matt, I don't, I don't want to dox him out or whatever, but you can go back to the feature topic link for the conversation episodes and check that out. I believe that's when we talked about it. We talked so many times that aren't, that I never posted up. So I usually just post up the first conversations episode, but I talk to these people. I talk to these guys, these supporters every month, but I believe that that's the one that is posted is we were talking about uh, the geopolitics and how, especially in the middle East, how, when the geopolitics shifts, it shifts so fast that you could still like it gains context almost by the, by the minute. Right. So this is interesting that, you know, we're talking about the crusades and we're also talking about, uh, basically geopolitics, you know, on like a medieval scale, perhaps this book explores how the crusades were organized, funded the German involvement in the crusades in the Holy lands. First Powell argues that, uh, family was important in the crusades. The family members usually went on crusades together, the bishop encouraged their own natal families to go on crusades. Powell argues the fifth crusade failed because it did not bring all of the Christian forces to bear all at the same time. Okay. So we're kind of getting away from us here. So we're just going to scratch this. Put that one away back to the baptism or death. The Wendish crusade, 1147 to 1185. By Kirk Freeman. The continuing threat, writes Mr. Freeman. For the time being, the winds were left relatively alone, blissfully ignorant of the coming storm, while the Germans bickered among themselves over who would rule the Holy Roman Empire. In 1152, Frederick Barbarossa became the new Holy Emperor. Barbarossa, like his predecessors, was more interested in Southern Europe and Italy, carrying little about the Wendish pagans to the east, unfortunately for the Wends. However, his cousin Henry the Lion had his eyes set firmly on the east and already had started building a power base to seize more Wendish territory in the process. Henry made an enemy of the equally greedy and land-hungry Archbishop of Hamburg, Brahmen, who claimed a portion of the Wendish lands for the church and himself, even though not a single church had been built there, nor had he ever visited the region. Henry the Lion's intrusion into Wendish territory was sporadic and temporary, But to the north of him lay the lands of Adolf II of Holstein, who waged almost nonstop war against the Wends, not for religious reasons, but for territorial and mineral rights. At the same time, the religious orders continued with their own schemes as well. 
The most zealous of these orders was led by Eskil, a Danish noble who became an Archbishop of Lund in 1138 and held the position for 40 years. Eskil encouraged the building of monasteries and ordered Danish warriors to stop slaughtering those Wends who promised to be baptized. But Eskil had a warlike side as well. When his army and that of Danish king Valdemar moved against the Wends in 1158, Eskil led his men with such unrelenting vigor that he reprimanded his warriors whenever they stopped to rest. Well, fuck that guy. Eskil and his uh, minions harried the Wends relentlessly until his death in 1177. And then there was a Wendish rebellions. After their brief respite in 1147, the death knell began ringing Again for the winds, Henry the Lion had grown wealthy off the land he had conquered, building cities and trade centers and profiting equally from his beneficial arrangement with both the German and Wendish peoples. He and the majority of his vassals made peace with Nyklot, who had fought hard to hold on to his land and now found the trade with Henry and his allies more profitable, profitable and far less painful. From 1147... To 1164, however, several other Wendish princes fought to recover the taxes Henry had wrung from their lands. During one of these rebellions, Henry joined forces with Danish king Valdemar to attack Wends once more. While the Danes ravished the coasts, Henry marched his forces into the hinterlands in a ferocious battle in 1160. Nyklot was killed, and his sons were driven across the Warnow River in 1164. One of Nyklot's sons, Pribslav, Pris, <laughs> attacked and retook the lands lost four years before and uh, in even smashed a large Saxon army at Virchen near Demen from the last time. Henry allied with Vladimir and finally drove Pribslav to uh, the two Christian leaders had a falling out a year later when Valdemar refused to share the spoils he had acquired during the reign on the Baltic coast. A reorganization of the church in 1164 stopped the intense taxation on the conquered territory and the Wendish princes in the area curtailed their efforts for independence. In 1166, Prebslav even married one of Henry's daughters. Oh yeah, son. Here's to you, Preb's love. And their son, Henry Berwin, eventually became Duke of Mecklenburg, a large area of northern Germany, north of the Elbe River. This marked a period of uneasy peace between the Wends and the Germans, a more dangerous threat existed with the Danes against whom Henry now encouraged the winds to fight Mecklenburg. I think that I be, I think that I've been to Mecklenburg. I used to get up North every now and again. I think I've been to Mecklenburg. The Danes and Wends had raided and plundered each other for centuries, but strife within the Danish kingdom had always barred the Danes from making true military campaign against their ancient rivals. All this changed in 1162, when King Valdemar united Denmark under his rulership. One of the first orders of business was to take the northern coast of the Wendish lands on his own. Accordingly, he seized Arconia and harried Mecklenburg. No, my beloved Mecklenburg! So, so much that Prislav was forced to appeal to the Germans for aid against the Danish attacks. The Germans were unable or unwilling to help, aside from sending a few advisors and engineers. I got a drink to that. A drink to some German combat engineers. And that Wendish fleet subsequently was annihilated by the Danes off the Falster coast. On December 6, 1172 and 1177, Valdemar defeated 
the Mecklenburg Wendish forces in battle and seized their territory. When Vladimir died in 1182, the Wends again rose in rebellion, but subsequently were defeated by Valdemar's son, Canuit. Canuit captured and imprisoned the major Wendish leaders in the region, including Henry Berwin, Prislab's son. Eventually, Canuit uh, relented and and restored Berwin as Duke of Mecklenburg. Yay for Mecklenburg! But although Germany still controlled the region's churches, the land was effectively under Danish rule. Danish rolls? What? The first of many crusades against the Balts. Now a large chunk of Wendish lands had been irretrievably lost. And even uh, though... This area would later regain a measure of autonomy. The Wen's cherished way of life was gone forever. During the most recent Danish raids, the Wen's land was burned and flooded, and the people living on it were slaughtered mercilessly. The Wendish will, uh, will to resist had been completely crushed by countless years of unrelenting warfare. In 1185, the final Wendish prince in any real power, Bolsavag, Bog, Bog, <sighs> Bogislav made one last attack against the Danes and he lost. He even managed to lose his horse. The net, well, come on. Why you gotta fuck with the guy like that? Poor Bogislav. The next day, he ordered surrender negotiations with Archbishop Absalon of uh, Denmark. And he was carried back to his tent, weeping and drunk. Here's to you, Bogoslav, and your missing horse, weeping and drunk. After the negotiations were completed. In 1147 uh, to 1185, Northern Europe went through a great metamorphosis. The German Christian church gained power. Internally, while the nobility was off fighting for Wendish lands in civil war toward Denmark, the new unity became possible after the people joined forces against their ancient enemies, the Wends. With the forced conversion of the Wends, the church assumed a divine right to lead future crusades for the conversion of the East. Future generations of Wends would even join these crusades, their nobles and knights entering such holy orders as the Teutonic Knights of Germany to wage a holy war for land and profit. Many of these Wendish people escaped eastward, but those who remained behind eventually made common cause with the Christians to root out their cousins. Until the mid-16th century, there would be almost continuous warfare against pagan enemies. Real or imagined, the Wendish Crusade was merely the first of many, including the Baltic Crusade against Livonia. That's uh, near Detroit. Prussia, which is uh, near Philadelphia. <laughs> Estonia, Finland, uh, 1200 to 1292. The Lithuania Crusade, 1283 to 410. And the Novgorod, the Novgorod, Novgorod Crusade against the Russians in 1400 to 1562. All right. I hope you guys are liking the Second Crusade episodes, and I believe we'll be back to it next month. I'm John, and this is the Abercast. Check out the website. Hey, while you're looking, check out the store section. There's some comic books, graphic novels, uh, some te fly-ass t-shirts, by the way. And also my tarot card deck that I just completed is now available. There's an e-store set up for it. You can check it all just under the store link. It's busted into three different stores because... Just because... That's just the way it is. The t-shirts are sweet. The tarot cards are the are fucking awesome. They're great. You can see the whole section. All the prints of all the cards right there on the website. And don't forget, the uh, Water of the Art operation is coming up this week. I'm making a lot, though. So, 
if you're interested and you're not signed in, so you can't, so you can't become like a Patreon or a subscribe star until next week or two weeks from now, drop a line. I'm making 12, I'm making 12 bottles of these things. I'm keeping one. So there you go. There's going to be some, a few left over. It's for the $10 tier, the vessel of the art tier. Um, so thank you guys very much for listening. I hope you enjoy it. Let me know what you think. And I'll let Hill uh, tell you the rest. Thank you for listening to this episode. Send an email or visit us on social media to let us know what you think about this topic. And please remember to leave a five-star rate and review. Hey, did you learn something? Did you laugh? Supporting me is a way for you to be a part of the Abercast and ensure its growth and sustainability. It also means I can create a normal schedule for shows and bonus shows, as well as the exclusive fellow craft episodes. By supporting the show, you are not only a listener, but you are a part of the show. You supporting the show gives me a way to offer fun rewards as a thank you for showing your appreciation and support for our projects. Do you have an idea for a reward that you don't see? Let me know. My supporters are my partners. I currently pay for you to listen to the Abercast. Not only do I pay the hosting bills out of my own pocket, I volunteer my time and uh, talent to each and every episode of the Abercast. The price of books, the time and resources of reading and researching, the massive amounts of gin and tonic needed, the equipment it takes to record the shows, the time and resources it takes to create the bonus material, and the cost to maintain the internet presence. Is it worth your support? I don't know. I'm proud of the Abercast, and I feel like I'm improving all the time. In addition uh, to creating the show, that you dig and that you are excited about. I also have a full-time commitment and other obligations. So why financial support? All of the supporters help me focus my time in on the quality and development of the podcast. And what if you can't afford, you know, $1 or $3 or $10 or whatever a month? Believe me, I get that. There are many degrees of support, but if you can't support the show financially, please consider leaving a five-star rate and review on your preferred podcast app. And don't forget that you can sign into the mailing list and still unlock a lot of bonus content. Thank you. I cannot put into words how much it means to me that you listen to the show each time I post a new episode. Your feedback, support, and love of the stories that we talk about here is what keeps me going.